Welcome back to our wetland classroom. It's great to see you again. In our last video, you learned about sea level rise and how it's affecting our wetlands in Delaware. Today, you're going to learn about the animals that use wetlands as their home and how they've adapted to and are dependent upon the specific conditions in wetlands. So Delaware is home to 28 different species of amphibians, which includes frogs and salamanders. But what are amphibians? Well, like reptiles, they're cold-blooded, which means they rely on the outside temperature to control their, um, their core temp body temperature. But unlike reptiles, they have smooth skin, which is permeable to gas and water. So um, they're kind of thought of as a canary in a coal mine to determine if the wetlands healthy or not, because they take in the toxins that are in wetlands and, breathe, and take it in through their skin. So um, it's a really good indicator of the health of the wetland. So one of the easiest ways to find frogs in Delaware is to simply visit the wetlands at night and listen to what frogs are calling. So each species in Delaware has its own distinct call. For example, uh, New Jersey coarse frogs sound like rubbing your fingers across the teeth of a comb. And uh, cricket frogs sound like hitting two marbles together. And northern green frogs sound like someone plucking the strings on a banjo. So by going out to these ponds and just listening to what's calling, you can identify all the species that are present in each wetland. A lot of the frog species in Delaware also have distinct characteristics about their appearance which helps you separate different species from another. For example, the leopard frog and the prickle frog are really, really similar looking until you look closely. So leopard frogs have a bright white spot in their tympanum, which is their ears on the side of their head. And um, pickle frogs have bright yellow underlegs. And so when you flip one over, you can look at it and you can easily identify the two species from one another. So Delaware is also home to many populations of salamanders, which come to these ponds every spring to breed before they leave and uh, forage in the upland habitats surrounding each wetland. However, there's one species of salamander that's really unique. It's the marble salamander. So earlier today, we came out and found a pair of marble salamanders under this log. See here, we have a larger adult and then a small juvenile. And so what makes these salamanders unique is that they actually come to the ponds in early fall when the ponds are actually completely dry. And so the adult salamanders will come to these ponds during heavy rains and breed. And then the males will leave and the females will stay and lay their eggs under logs and leaves and uh, laying down vegetation so lay about 50 to 150 eggs in the ponds and then stay with the eggs and guard them against other potential predators and so once these heavy fall rains come in and brings the water level back up in the ponds it'll inundate the eggs and the eggs will hatch and then the females will leave the ponds and then the larvae will stay in the ponds over winter and get larger and then emerge usually about um, early to late spring so amphibians are a really important part of Delaware's wetland ecosystems. Um, they're fed on by a lot of larger animals such as birds, reptiles, and fish. We also do a really good job of keeping out pest populations. So tadpoles that live in these ponds will eat mosquito larvae. And so they'll keep down the mosquito populations around these areas. It's so not only an amphibians important part of Delaware's ecosystems, but also a really important part of Delaware's natural heritage. Delaware wetlands are home to hundreds of bird species. Some of these birds uh, just migrate through and spend, you know, just a few weeks, a couple of days. Some of them will migrate here and spend the winter, and others are here year round. For the ones that migrate through, they're traveling along the Mid-Atlantic Flyway, which extends from the Arctic down the North American coast along South America, as far south as Argentina. So when these birds migrate, they stop off at places just like this, that have habitat so that they can rest, there's food, and it kind of gives them that fuel they need to keep moving. Some of them though go from the Arctic where the breeding grounds are to Delaware and they spend the winter here. Those would be things like our snow geese. Once again, you would see them just in a place just like this. And they stay here, they fatten up, they eat lots and lots of food, and then they will go back to the Arctic the following fall to mate and reproduce. But then we have our bird species that stay here year round. Uh, they like to stay, once again, these amazing salt marshes. They're pretty much the bee's knees when it comes to wetland types. And they stay here year round. However, many of them are hard to see. Uh, you're more likely just to hear them. So what we do so we can kind of track how many are here, we do secretive marsh bird surveys in the springtime. So starting in the beginning of May, through the very beginning of June, we go out very early mornings and we set up at uh, random sites and we are looking for those species that uh, will give us a better idea of how healthy the marsh is. So some of them are, are rail species. We have the Clapper rail, uh, the Virginia rail, the black rail, and the king. Uh, all of those except the black rail live here year round. And you're most likely hear them, but you won't see them. 
Um, if you've ever been into a salt marsh, you have heard the clapper rail. It's one of the most common, uh, distinct salt marsh sounds that you will come across. So what we do is we set up and we listen for them. And if we hear them, we'll mark it down and we mark how many we hear. Uh, other species we're looking for are the bitterns, which are part of the egret and heron family. Um, and they're even harder to find than the rails uh, because not only are they hard to uh, see visually, they're also hard to hear. But if you do hear an American bittern, it's pretty much the coolest noise ever. Uh, it kind of sounds like water dripping in a cave. Um, it kind of <laughs> it sounds like unkalunka, unkalunka. <laughs> And so we will mark all those birds down. But not only do we mark down the rare species, we also look for the more common ones as well, like our marsh wrens, our seaside sparrows, our red-winged blackbirds. Because even though they're not as exciting as the bitterns or the rails, uh, they still give us a really good picture of how healthy our marsh is. The Delaware Bay and the Delaware Bay Shore are part of what is known as a globally important bird area, meaning that it's been designated as a spot that if you're a birder and you wanna see some really cool birds, this is where you wanna come. And because of that, thousands of people come to Delaware every year just to see our birds. For the migrations, for the ones who stay here year round, people come to see those. Bringing millions of dollars to the Delaware economy. So not only are birds uh, an important part of the Delaware heritage and our history, they're also really important for our economy. Delaware is home to 32 reptile species. These reptiles can be found throughout the state, but many rely on wetlands to sustain their life. The diamondback terrapin is thought to be one of the only species in the world that lives in brackish water. Brackish water is a mixture of fresh and salt water. These terrapins live uh, most of their life in tidal creeks, which are in salt marshes. So they swim around in the marsh, and they eat fish and, and small crabs to sustain themselves. The diamondback terrapin has these diamond shapes on its back, as well as many of them will have white lipstick, or it looks like white lipstick on their mouth. Terrapins nest in sandy habitat. In Delaware, we've lost a bit of this habitat due to the construction and storms. They also have trouble getting to the sandy habitat due to roadways. If you've ever traveled to the beaches in Delaware, you've most likely seen some signs along the road warning travelers of terrapins crossing the road. So it's important to maintain a careful eye while you're driving and make sure you don't run over these guys. Another reptile that lives in Delaware's wetlands is the bog turtle. But unlike the terrapin, the bog turtle lives in a very specific freshwater wetland habitat. They like very uh, wet meadowy type habitat with sedges. And a lot of that habitat has been lost in Delaware. And along with some illegal pet trading, the population of bog turtles has really declined. They're listed as threatened on the federal level and endangered on the state level. So these animals really need our protection. There are only a few known locations where bog turtles reproduce in Delaware, but with freshwater wetland protection, we can help ensure that they can be found in Delaware into the future. When you sit down to enjoy a nice piece of fish or shellfish, you don't immediately think of wetlands, but you should. We're out here today at the Aquatic Resource Education Center in Smyrna, Delaware, surrounded by some of the animals that you can find in the Delaware estuary. One of them uh, is the blue crab which is one of the most commercially important shellfish that we have here in Delaware. Uh, what they do is when you have a blue crab spawn, they spawn kind of the mouths of the freshwater river, so say like the Delaware River that empties into the Delaware Bay. They're spawned there and then the larvae will move out into the Atlantic Ocean where it's more saline conditions. They'll metamorphose a few times and then they'll come back in and they're going to hang out in the channels and our tidal guts in our wetlands where there is plenty of food and there is uh, areas for them to hide out in. I have one to show you today. The blue crab is a very distinct looking species due to its uh, blue color and that's back, let's flip her over, as well as their football shaped body as you can see. Now this is a female, I can tell based on a few things, one being the red tips on the claws, as well as her apron. This is actually a juvenile female, I can tell because it looks more like a pyramid, whereas an adult female would look more like the Capitol Dome. And if it was a male, it would look more like the Washington Monument. So these blue crabs, after they spawn and they come back, they stay in these channels where, that they, where they can find food. 
They also need them though, however, for when they grow. So unlike us who have a internal skeleton, blue crabs have an external skeleton. And so it's their hard shell. So to grow, they can't just grow inside the shell like we do inside our skin. They have to actually molt their shell and grow a new one. So what will happen is on the back here is where it's going to open up and they will actually move out of the shell and they'll be soft. So when they're soft though, they're very vulnerable to predation. So they need to have places that they can hide out and be safe. That's where our salt marshes come in. Uh, they have grasses along the bottom, they have soft mud, and they can cuddle down in there until they're hard enough to emerge and be safe again. Another crab species that we have here on our marsh is the fiddler crab. So you may have seen them, well, you probably have seen them if you've ever been anywhere close to a marsh edge. They're about yay big, and if it's the male, it'll have one big claw and one small one. So often people think the big claw is to take and fight for the other females. It's really just to get their attention. So what they'll do is they'll stand there and they'll bounce up and down and move their claw. And each subset, uh, subspecies has their own specific wave that they do. It's kind of their way of saying, hey ladies, I'm the best mate, so you know you want to come over here. And that's how they find their mate. Now what they eat is detritus. So if you've ever seen where they're fiddler crabs, you'll see these little balls of mud. And those balls are because they take in and they pull up the mud and they eat all the detritus out of it, which is dead and decaying uh, plant uh, and animal matter. And then they put the mud back out. So they actually do a really good job of kind of stirring up the mud in our marshes to keep them healthy. Um, and then you see the little burrows all along the side, which also allow for oxygen to get down into the soil and to mix the nutrients from the bottom to the top. Wetlands and the animals that depend on these habitats are part of the rich heritage and natural history that is uniquely Delaware. Thank you for joining us today to learn about the animals that depend on these wetlands for their home and to learn how wild our wetlands can be.